Hello, everybody. Chris here. And in this video, I want to show all of you how you can do a screen replace inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. So as we can see on this video, the screen we're obviously going to be replacing is that little Android phone screen. One of the challenges you'll notice as I hit play is that the phone is actually going to move across the screen during this duration. So we're going to require some tracking in order to make this happen. So a good place that we can achieve everything we're going to need for this effect is going to be over on the Fusion page. So we're just taking the base video clip going over to the Fusion page, and you should see media in and media out. The first thing we'll start by doing is using a planar tracker node in order to track the movement of the screen across the shot. So I'm going to go to frame zero to start here. I'll close this clips window for extra space on the nodes at the bottom. And with media one selected, you'll know it's selected because it'll be highlighted. I'm going to right click on the line right in front of it. I'm going to go to add tool down to tracking and then planar tracker. So when we use a planar tracker, we're going to need to set up a shape to determine the area which DaVinci Resolve is going to track. So in our case, that's obviously going to be this green box for the phone right here. So with these tools at the top, I'm just going to leave it at the default for click append. I'm going to hold control down and middle mouse wheel to zoom in on the areas where I want to set the first point. So this is a rectangular shape. We can just go ahead and set four points and that'll be very ideal for what we're trying to do here. So I'm going to zoom in and add a point roughly here. And I'm not going to press and hold because I don't want any bezier curves. I just want straight lines. So for this next point, I'm just going to left click and now we'll go navigate downwards to the bottom here. I'm going to left click and then the fourth point over here. And now we just need to close the loop by going back up top and then left click up here. By the way, if you're wondering how I'm panning around, you just press and hold middle mouse button in order to achieve that to get this kind of effect. OK, so now we can zoom out a bit and now we have our tracking shape because we were at frame zero when we set this up. We're only going to need to track forward. Uh, you can actually take a different point in time to use as the base reference point. But then when you do that, you'll need to hit set for the new reference point and you'll need to track not only forward, but also in reverse. But in our case, going from frame zero, I can just hit this track to the end button. And since this is a really clearly defined shape with an obvious color and brightness difference than the other areas around it, I expect this to work really well on the first try. So let's go ahead and track to end here. And we can see that it's just kind of breezing through all of the keyframes for this tracking. But you'll notice that our shape keeps following the uh, screen's location across the shot. And that's what we're looking for. So if all goes well, I should get to the final frame here. And now we can take this data and use it to adjust the position of the screen overlay we'll add on. And the way we're going to extract the data is by using this Create Planner Transform button. So if I go ahead and click that, we get a new node. The planar tracker at this point is no longer going to be necessary. We can leave it there, or if you'd like, you can just disconnect it from everything else, if that makes it less confusing. And we're going to need to take this media one node and merge it with something else. So we're going to have a second clip layering on top of the bottom clip. I'm going to right click, go to add tool, composite, merge. And in this case, the media one is going to be our background node so that whatever else we add from this point forward can sit on top of the background, the original clip, and basically serve as that overlay. So the merge one will feed to media out. And if you do that, you should be able to see the preview for media out once again in this preview window. So now let's bring in the clip that we want to use as our overlay to replace the screen. So I'm going to go to the media pool, top left hand corner, and I'm just going to drag this clip right onto the node graph. So you should see media input two pop up here. One thing though, in this case, using two different stock clips that we recorded differently, they don't have the same resolution. If I have this uh, new clip selected and I go over to metadata, we can see that this is recorded in uh, 30, 3840 pixels by 2160 resolution, which doesn't match our original timeline. So for consistency's sake, we may want to add in a resize node. So with media in two selected, I'm going to right click in front, go to add tool, go to transform resize. I'll connect media in two to this, and I'm just going to resize it to our timeline size, which is uh, 1920 pixels by 1080. You can always go to file and then project settings in order to confirm that what your settings are up here. 
Okay, now we need to take this planner transform over here. And I'm going to connect the resize to planner transform. And then the planner transform data is going to control the position of this new clip we're adding in. So I'll connect this to the merge as the foreground, the green connector. And once this pops in here, we should see this clip move around the screen as the shot progresses. So if I go to frame zero and hit play, it'll be a little choppy, but we should see some kind of movement for this clip that's layering on top of everything. Now that's gonna be tracking the shot, but obviously it's way too big. We need to add a mask to it in order to trim its size down and display only the bit of the top clip uh, on top of the screen. So I'll do that really easily by going to frame zero here. I'm gonna click on media input two, and you may notice there is a blue input connector here for a effect mask node. So the kind of mask we'll use is just a polygon mask. So I'll click on polygon, and now we need to determine, and now we need to set up the boundaries for that mask. Now, because planner transforms already in place, we only need to set this up for one frame, and then the planner transform will move the mask just like it moves the clip. So zooming in here, we're gonna basically do the same thing again. We're gonna set up four corners. So I'm gonna left click here. I'm gonna left click over here and just keep going downwards, add extra points. And then let's reconnect everything back up here at the top with a left click. And now we should have roughly the shape of our screen. If we go 10, 20 frames in, we should see our masked out shape keeps tracking the location of the screen across the shot, which is what we're looking for. One thing I would note is that uh, this polygon mask shape has a 100% hard edge, which means that as you go from the inside of the mask shape to directly outside of it, there's no transition. It's just either on or off. So you may consider adding just a little bit of a soft edge to kind of smooth the difference between the top clip and the bottom clip, blur them together a little bit. Whether you do that or not, though, the background of the phone before we added this clip, which layers on top of it, had a green screen. So that doesn't really have the same light emission color as this new screen. So we might want to take that color, and you can see over on the thumb, it's really obvious here, and to shift it to a color that actually looks more like the new screen we've added on. So if we go over to the color page, then uh, we can do that really easily. Okay, so on the color page, if we zoom in, we can take a look at our clip and we can see that from the base clip, there's still a lot of this green reflection, especially on the person's hand and a little bit of emanation from the screen itself. So uh, there's several places we could use to kind of correct this. One could be the color curve, specifically hue versus two. So if you click on curves and then you go over to the second tab here, you can basically uh, add points to the graph and target specific colors from the original shot and shift it over towards new colors in the final result. So I'm going to add a couple points to the left and the right over here. And then I'm going to take this middle range by adding a third point, And we can shift this up and down in order to control the color, uh, mostly that's going to be coming from the person's hand. Since it's the only green thing in the shot, this works really simply. And so we can probably just get away with shifting this downwards towards something of a blue hue. We may need to add a couple more points on the outer areas. If you just play around with it and shift it around a little bit, you can change the color that is going to be emanating from the hand. We can click on this little icon at the top to bypass color effects. So basically we can see the before and after, after we've uh, made changes through Fusion and the color page. So here's the original. You can see that the color over here is a lot more green, but here we added in with the hue curves and the color that's being reflected on the hands is a lot closer to what we see on the screen. Now, if for some reason there's another green or similarly colored area inside of your video clip as well, then you can limit the color page effects as well with a power window so that these color shifts that we do will only apply on the screen area. So if I go in here to power window, we can use the polygon tool. I'll do a rough outline of the phone area just down here. Okay, connect it back up there at the top. And now the effects are only gonna apply to the area inside of this uh, power window mask. So of course, the phone moves across the shot. So there's also tracking available on the 
color tab. So if we go right over here to tracker, we can take this power window we created, hit play, and uh, track it forward. So this will just take a couple more seconds in order to generate uh, tracking for the power window to follow across the shot. So really similar to the planar tracker on the Fusion page as well. Okay, and uh, just for the record, if you don't like how this tracker window has a hard edge where it's either on or off, you can also add in a little bit of softness to it. So if we add softness and inside and outside, then this will set up a little bit of a buffer zone where it kind of smooths uh, the effect from being off outside of the power window to being on inside of the power window. Just another little tool you can kind of play around with there. However, you only need the power windows if there's another object inside of the same shot that looks quite similar so that as you shift the colors, you can target it to the power window. So if you don't need that at all, we can just disable the power window and just make sure that all of the greens across the shot, which pretty much is just here, are gonna be color shifted to what we need it to be. So back on the Fusion page, I'd probably just give it one more check, check the border width, see if it's better with that or without that. And maybe I would tone down the soft glow a bit as well. I, I think I would want at least a tiny bit though. So after you've adjusted all of your settings, played around with it for a little while, you can go back to the edit page, hit play, and see roughly how everything's going to look in your final export. So that's pretty much going to be it for how you can do a simple screen replace in DaVinci Resolve 17. I hope all of you got something out of this video. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in my future video content.